Hello once again YouTube and welcome to another episode of Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal. Today we'll be starting in Celadon City, heading west to the Cycling Road, which will take us all the way down to Fuchsia City, and then from there, after getting that gym badge, we can head east, up the route that leads to Lavender Town. I never took that route in Generation 1, so it's going to be interesting to explore it in Generation 2. So Cycling Road is exactly what you'd expect. You're automatically going down, just like in the original Cycling Road, and this patch of grass actually has a brand new Pokémon to capture. I think you can find this Pokémon in a couple of different places, but here we have the Lava Slug Pokémon Slugma for some reason. It's nowhere near a volcano or anything, so it's kind of weird for it to appear here on the Cycling Road, where it would probably cause all of the grass to be set on fire just by touching it, because this thing is literal lava. It can't even sleep, according to the Pokédex, because if it did, it would harden into molten rock. Thing is, it also knows Harden, which would probably accomplish the same thing. I guess this is classic Pokedex entries in action, right? They're probably not even close to being true. You know, there's a theory that the player character is the one writing the Pokedex entries, and they're only age 10, so that probably explains how some of the Pokedex entries were written. But then again, that is just a theory. In fact, you know what? Short ran about this. I had to put Slugma to sleep in order to capture it, so why didn't it turn into Molten Rock straight away? Was it not asleep for long enough? How did Sleep Powder work on this thing? Wouldn't the spores just burn as soon as it touches the lava? I don't get it. At any rate, a fire type acquired this late in the game is probably not going to be very useful, especially when it's caught at level 25, but 25 is still a fairly okayish level. It still needs 13 levels before it evolves, but I can deal. So this guy says the cycling road is a great shortcut to Celadon City. Yeah, it's a great shortcut alright, except for the fact that you have to ride your bike uphill in order to go up the cycling road and into Celadon City. And this guy's a bird keeper anyways, wouldn't he just fly on his Noctowl? Does he not have HMO2? I'm asking too many questions here. So yes, I'm going to be using the EXP share to level up some of my lower level Pokémon and get their evolutions. Starting with Sentret, evolving into Furret at level 15, which is really early and I should have done this way, way earlier in the game. It's really late to be leveling up Sentret of all things, but better late than never, I've got a Furret now that's one more Pokédex entry off my list. Now there's only about 35 left to go. We have arrived in Fuchsia City, which unfortunately has almost nothing interesting about it besides the gym. See, the thing is, they did not include every area from Gen 1 in Gen 2's Kanto, and unfortunately one of the cuts made was the Safari Zone, although the map data is still in the ROM for some reason. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but due to either cartridge size limitations or just running out of time, they didn't really put all of that much into some of the towns that we're going to be seeing today. And sometimes there's an explanation for it, but for now, let's just head on into the Fuchsia City Gym. Very interesting gimmick here, all of the trainers are disguised as the gym leader, who is actually Koga's daughter, Janine. Janin, Jad, Nine. Whatever the pronunciation of the name is, it's very interesting to see a gym actually change hands in the time frame between Generations 1 and 2. So let's see what Koga's daughter has up her sleeve that her father did not. Uh, level 36, I see. Okay, maybe there's some conservation of ninjutsu going on and she's actually going to send out the stronger Pokémon later on in the fight. Dude, this Pokémon is even lower level than the first one was. What's going on here? Okay, I'm gonna be completely honest, I think the logic here was that Janine is a very new gym leader, so of course her Pokémon are not going to be all that experienced, and she also uses Dire Hit on her Venomoth for some reason. I've never seen a gym leader use Dire Hit, but honestly, I think the story and gameplay integration that they go for sometimes actually hurts the game part of the game because... Like, maybe you could say that this is a Poison-type gym, and therefore it was never going to be all that challenging anyways, because, come on, Poison is the weakest type in these early generations, even though there's so many of them. But seriously, I think you could do just a whole lot better with some of the Kanto gym leaders. And in particular, the three gym leaders that I fight in today's video are probably the weakest out of the entire Kanto region, so that's gonna be saying something. I gotta give props to the Venomoth, however, because it only double-teamed once and managed to dodge four Ice Punches. Yes, double-team is still a very annoying move, and interestingly, there is a move in this game that can allow you to copy the enemy's stat buffs, so that is something that you could try. I mentioned this in the Sabrina fight, I think. 
This move that I'm speaking of is called Psych Up, and what I didn't mention was, in order to get the TM for Psych Up, you have to transfer in a Pokémon from Generation 1 whose catch rate just so happens to line up with the item ID for the TM containing Psych Up. Really, really strange, but again, a bonus for playing Generation 1, I suppose. There are a couple other TMs you can get this way, such as Detect and Ice Punch, oddly enough. And, uh, unfortunately, no, I do not have anything interesting to say about this fight. I mean... What can you do? It's a Poison-type gym. You use Psychic Attacks, you use Ground Attacks, maybe switch it up a little and use some Ice here and there. And that pretty much gets you through. I mean, if you want to see Marowak in action with that new Thick Club, you can see that she's doing a lot more damage now. One hit from Bone Meringue is enough to knock out these guys, whereas normally it would take both hits of Bone Meringue, but still a one-turn knockout. Now, interestingly, you actually receive a TM after defeating Janine. You get the TM for Toxic, which is the same move that Koga gives you after you beat him in Generation 1. It's actually really interesting. Why do only two of the Kanto Gym Leaders give you a TM after beating them? We got Giga Drain from Erika, and now we got Toxic from Janine. It's really strange. I mean, if the Kanto Gym Leaders aren't going to be all that challenging, they could at least give out some interesting prizes for defeating them. But oh well. If you were wondering, I am starting to really believe that Kanto needs a lot more to make it interesting as a region. As I said, it feels very much like a victory lap in this generation, but in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, I definitely remember there being a lot more to the Kanto region that you could do. At least there were more places to explore and stuff. So, I kinda wish I was playing that at this point. In fact, I'm so desperate for things to talk about that I'm actually going to point out a trainer class that I had never actually seen before going down this route. So, there are teachers on this route, and I've never seen this trainer class before in Generation 2. Legit have not seen them ever. They weren't in Johto at all, as far as I can recall, but then again, I did skip a lot of trainer battles, so maybe there was one of them back there? But it is really weird. I've never seen that sprite before. What the heck? This trainer also had a Cubone, and I don't think I've pointed out how cool the animations are in Pokémon Crystal, but Cubone, when it gets sent out, tosses his little bone, and I just love it so much. This and Stadium 2 have some really great animation work, they're just full of personality. Now, these are high-quality animations, boys and girls. Trainers on this route also like to give out lots and lots of money, so keep that amulet coin equipped, and uh, fight all the trainers if you want lots and lots of money. You're probably going to need it to buy a bunch of vitamins if you want to do long-term competitive Pokémon training in Generation 2. Does anyone still play this competitively? Oh, what am I saying? Of course people still play it competitively. Anyways, a couple of interesting NPCs are on this route. One trainer had his dialogue changed in Pokémon Crystal to hint at a new feature in Crystal version. So, only in Crystal version, when you catch a Pokémon, the game will actually record where it was caught. Which is important because leveling up a Pokémon in the same place you caught it is going to increase your friendship even more than normal, which is just a little bit strange. I mean, do Pokémon really want to remember where they were caught? Seems like it would be just a bit traumatic. There was also a girl willing to trade a Chansey for an Aerodactyl. I don't know how she got a hold of Aerodactyl, the fossil Pokémon that you had to revive in Generation 1 to get it but trading a Chansey for it is probably a really bad idea, because Chansey are rare enough as it is, and you could just transfer an Aerodactyl from Gen 1, so really bad trade in my opinion. And as we pass through this fence maze of a route, I would like to point out that there are still cut trees this late in the game. I mean, there were cut trees in Gen 1 as well, so it makes sense for them to be in Kanto, but I really wish they would just get rid of all the cut trees. There's no point in me keeping a Pokémon with cut, this entire time. Like, it doesn't add to the gameplay, and... Oh, jeez, another call from Joey. Why does this guy always want to talk to me about his Rattata? It's insane. Hooray, Joey, you managed to beat a Caterpie. I'm sure your mother is very proud. I actually haven't gotten that kind of phone call very often throughout this entire playthrough, but then again, for Gold Version in particular, I never really gave out my phone number to the in-game trainers all that often. Interestingly, in Kanto, you actually can't give out your phone number to any of the trainers, which is very, very strange. I mean, technically, you can give your phone number to a couple of trainers on Route 27. In fact, speaking of those two particular trainers, if you rematch them enough times, they will actually have Pokémon with held items that you can steal, so it's possible to farm Focus Bands and King's Rocks off of them. 
You can, in fact, steal items from some of the trainers, but it's not that much throughout the entire game. A couple berries here and there, and the hold items that I just mentioned. Still, if you want to be mean, that's a good way to do it. Anyways, next up on our list of items to gather, there is the Super Rod, which can be obtained in this house on the way to Lavender Town. The Super Rod is actually obtained in the same place in Generation 1 as it is in Generation 2, so that's a little bit interesting. The great thing about the Super Rod is that it fishes up Pokémon at level 40, which is actually pretty high, which means you should get a decent amount of experience from them, I'm actually not sure if it's worth all that much, but level 40 means you can capture most Pokémon at a level where they only need one more level before they evolve. Now I am 99% certain that two of the fish Pokémon that I capture in this video can only be caught with the Super Rod, which means even if you do catch them in the Johto region, because they can be caught in the Johto region, they're still exclusive to the postgame because you can only find the Super Rod here. Which is kind of iffy, but I suppose it does give you a reason to go back to Johto, and this isn't the only thing that gives you a reason to go back to Johto. Anyways, what you can fish immediately after getting the Super Rod is Quillfish, a water poison type fish Pokemon that resembles a puffer fish. And uh, I really don't know why we needed another water poison type after Tentacool, but here you are, I guess. It's another one for the pile, and it doesn't evolve, so I don't need to use it after capturing it. I guess this one has some interesting moves, but I can't really imagine anyone seriously used Quillfish, but starting at level 40 is pretty decent for this part of the game. Apparently this thing swallows like 3 gallons of water at once, which I have no idea how a fish could do that, but this is the Pokémon universe. Anyway, with our business on this route over with, we can now head into Lavender Town, which has become a lot less spooky in the three-year time gap between Generation 1 and 2. The Pokémon Tower that housed all of those graves is now a radio tower, which is, uh, maybe just a little bit insensitive, but they did move all the graves to a particular house in the area, so it's not like they got rid of all the bodies or anything. This is still really spooky to talk about, but the only real point of interest in Lavender Town for our purposes is that after restoring the power plant, you can get an item that lets you listen to the radio here in Kanto, which is interesting. I thought you could listen to the radio while you were near the Pokémon League, but I guess that was just the Johto airwaves. Now we can pick up the Kanto airwaves, which doesn't really add a whole lot, but it does allow us to listen to the Poké Flute music. Yes, the Poké Flute is again obtained in Lavender Town, technically speaking, but it is instead in the form of a radio broadcast, which makes a lot of sense, because Kanto has a problem with Pokémon sleeping on the roads, apparently, so having a quick access method to waking them up is a very sensible idea. Anyways, I fought that trainer because he says absolutely nothing during the battle, which I thought was really weird, but apparently he was battling with his eyes closed, which is strange. And also that tree, it has a hidden revive in it, which is really interesting to me because I remember that tree from Generation 1. It had an escape rope before, now it has a revive. Are they saying something with that, maybe? Also, another change from Gen 1, there was no guardhouse between this route and the river route on the right. So, I don't know what's up with that. Seems weird to remove an entire guard tower. Well, we've arrived at Diglett's cave, which is still blocked, so now it's time to wake up Snorlax, and I do plan on capturing the Snorlax. It's the only one in the entirety of Generation 2, so might as well, even though I could transfer one in from Generation 1. And it starts at level 50, which is pretty good. I was initially thinking that Snorlax would be difficult to capture because it has Snore in addition to Rest. Snore lets it attack while sleeping, and Rest lets it go to sleep in order to restore health, and even more annoyingly, it's actually holding an item. It's holding the Leftovers, which will restore a little bit of HP every turn. Now, if you still have that Thief TM, you might consider getting rid of the Leftovers by stealing it, which is something you can do. Also, if you still have any of Kurt's Heavy Balls, they're also very effective here because Snorlax is very, very heavy, as you can imagine. However, in my case, I just chucked a Great Ball and caught it on the first Pokeball, so, uh, I guess Snorlax isn't that difficult to capture in this game after all. Hmm. Well, it does inflict a status upon itself, so that's probably a contributing factor. But still. Snorlax is a monster in competitive Gen 2 because using Curse on it is incredible. Sacrifice speed that Snorlax doesn't have anyways to boost its already bulky attack and defense stats, and it is a physical wall in every sense of the word, definitely a staple on every Generation 2 team. So it might just be a staple on my team as well, we'll see. 
I haven't shown it, but the path to Cinnabar Island is actually blocked off by a landslide for the time being, so we'll have to go through Diglett's Cave to Pewter City and then head south through Pallet Town and then surf through the water to get to Cinnabar Island that way. In the meantime, I actually wanted to try out something with Dugtrio here, uh, so I was wondering if Dugtrio decides to dig underground, can your Pokeball still capture it? And it looks like the answer to that is yes. There's also another reason I wanted to capture a Dugtrio in Crystal version specifically, but I'll show that off at the end of the video. But yeah, apparently Pokemon can be captured while they are underground. I guess the ball just gets tossed down the hole or something. Man, this game is weird sometimes. Once we're out of Diglett's Cave, we can finally proceed to Pewter City, just as long as you've got a Pokemon that knows Cut. And the first thing I'm going to do upon arriving is head on over to the Pokemon Center, not only to heal, but also to point out that the guy with the Jigglypuff that was sitting in the Pokemon Center in Generation 1 is apparently still there after three years. This is apparently a regular thing for him. I don't know. He likes showing off his Jigglypuff singing. One point of interest in Pewter City is an NPC with a trade offer. In Gold and Silver, he will trade Gloom for Rapidash, and in Crystal Version, they change the trade. It is now a Haunter for a Zetu. These have been available for a very long time now, so I really don't know why there's a trade for them now. Also in Pewter City is an old man who will give you an item that unlocks another legendary for you to capture. In Silver Version, he gives you the Rainbow Wing. In all other versions, he gives you the Silver Wing. As a reminder, the newly unlocked Legendary will be level 60 in Crystal Version and level 70 in all other versions, no matter who it was that you just unlocked. If you've been holding onto your Master Ball up to this point, this is probably the opportune time to use it. Not much else in town since the museum's closed, so the only thing left for us to do is to take on the Pewter City Gym. How poetic that we are closing in on the end of the game and we are just now taking on the first gym that Kanto trainers have to deal with. And, uh, you know, it is Brock, so unfortunately, I don't think there's going to be much to talk about in terms of challenge. He's still using a bunch of Pokémon that are double weak to one type or another. He also put a shirt on. Apparently, the Pokémon League is very strict when enforcing rules regarding indecent exposure. Okay, now it's time to try and fill five minutes of dead air. So, uh, first up is Graveler, who, uh, is not the final form of the Geodude line, oddly enough. I don't know why they didn't give Brock a Golem, they can afford to. And uh, he's still got his Onix, and he also has Fossil Pokémon for some reason. He's got Omastar, and he's got Kabutops. And finally, he has Rhyhorn, which is again, completely unevolved, and not even a decent level, if I remember right. So yeah, I really don't know what to say here. All of his Pokémon are double weak to grass, three of them are double weak to water, the Fossils are not weak to water, but they are weak to electric. And uh, all of them are also weak to ground, if you decided to bring that. They're probably weak to fighting as well. And they're also vulnerable to steel. These guys have like five different weaknesses. What a type. I mean, geez, I thought, you know, I thought facing Brock way later in the game would allow him to actually use stronger Pokemon, but they still didn't give him that much to work with. He's just got way too many weaknesses. Or I should say the type just has way too many weaknesses. There are some types that work better for gym leader battles where the enemy only has a single type of Pokemon. This is definitely not one of those types that actually works. Man, I remember all the way back at the beginning of my yellow version playthrough that Brock was actually challenging in that version specifically because they deny you access to all of the types that would normally destroy Brock completely and he wound up actually being challenging for it. You actually had to search for a Pokémon that could beat him. That being Mankey in my case, but most players stuck to the Nidoran line. They get Double Kick eventually. You know, I don't know if this would have accomplished much, but there's still one empty slot on Brock's team. He could have gotten Aerodactyl. That would have thrown me for at least a little bit of a loop, but I probably would have just destroyed Aerodactyl with ice moves anyways. But seriously, he needs real help in order to be a challenging gym leader this late in the game, right? But again, this does represent a lot of character growth for the player because you're the Johto champion now. Brock, of all people, shouldn't be posing a threat. Well, it just leaves only two more gyms left to conquer in the Kanto region. The one in Viridian City and the one on Cinnabar Island. We're going to be heading to Cinnabar Island next. We will be passing through Viridian City, however the gym is closed, go figure, apparently they have a problem with this very often. 
We'll be passing through Viridian Forest on the way down there, of course. However, they did something interesting with the Viridian Forest map. See, what they did was, I guess they didn't like having to put Viridian Forest on a completely separate map. So what they did was, Route 2 and Viridian Forest have kind of been merged into the same map, if you will. It's very strange, because you'll go through the forest, and the layout is kind of similar to the original Viridian Forest, but there's no tall grass, and therefore no Pokémon to encounter. You can find some items along the way, but there are also no trainers. I mean, there's a couple trainers on the route, but the forest itself doesn't have any bug catchers or anything. It's really weird. Now, I can't put my finger on it, but for some reason, walking through Viridian Forest kind of reminds me of Zelda 2, walking around on that overworld and dodging all the encounters. Only this time, there's no encounters to dodge. It's a really weird thing to be reminded of, I know. Anyhow, if you prefer to avoid the forest, which has no encounters in it, you could cut through the bushes and travel down the right side of the map. There's a couple of items for you to find there as well. Also, this music is cool. It is a remix of the original Viridian Forest, but they kind of took out the part of the song that was an allusion to the Team Rocket theme, so that's interesting. Interesting direction for the music to take, I rather like it. And now that we're entering Viridian City, I finally have something I can talk about for a little bit because they actually decided to add a new facility to Viridian City. It is the Trainer House. Here, once a day, you can battle a trainer. The trainer that you fight here, very interestingly, will actually have the party of the last player you mystery gifted with. Or, if you mystery gifted with Pokémon Stadium 2, like I've been doing this entire time, it will be one of three random teams. And if you have not mystery gifted at all, the opponent will simply have the three Johto starters at level 50. So this facility is actually really interesting. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because it's just another trainer battle at the end of the day. But because the opponent uses another player's party, it's actually possible for that player to set up their party in such a way that it really helps you out. For example, all Pokémon you see here get registered in the Pokédex as seen, so you can fill out the rest of the pages if you haven't gotten them yet. The other player could also set up an experience point mine for you. Six high-level Pokémon that are very easy to knock out because they've got all their moves deleted or something, so you can easily earn a lot of experience points and money. Or they could also set up a more controlled environment for getting your Smurgle the move it needs to sketch. I mean, it's held back by the fact that you can only fight here once per day, but it's still a really neat idea, and I'm glad they actually added something new to Viridian City, so players will be able to come back here. And it is pretty late in the game, this is probably the most opportune point to set up a grinding spot, if you need it, of course. Just make sure that your opponent doesn't use any Pokémon with Thief, because then the Trainer House could potentially steal your items. It is possible for the enemy to steal your items if, say, Ditto transforms into your Thief user, but I'm pretty sure you don't get the items back if they actually manage to steal something, which would be really, really awful if it happens, so be sure that it does not. And now it's time for the nostalgia to really start hitting, because we are on Route 1, headed for Pallet Town, and both of these locations have their classic music. Ah, it's so good. And there are a couple trainers here, oddly enough. They've got some way high-level Pokémon, compared to the Wild Encounters, at least. I like to think that they were aiming to challenge somebody from Pallet Town because this town has in fact produced two former champions, one of them being Blue, which is now the canonical name of the rival character from Generation 1, and the game also names his sister Daisy. In fact, Blue is now the leader of the Viridian City Gym, but he's often away for some reason. We'll have to find him, I guess. You can also enter the home of the protagonist from Generation 1, who in this game is named Red. Red, it seems, has also been away for a very long time, and he's causing his mother to worry. What a jerk, you should at least call your mother every now and again. But then again, the protagonists of this series can't talk, so maybe that's why he doesn't call. He can't say anything over the phone. He also upgraded his Super Nintendo to a Nintendo 64. Red is a man of culture, it seems. Sadly, Pallet Town is still really small, so there's not a lot to do besides maybe get your Pokedex rated or talk to the Technology is Incredible guy. But once you're ready, it's time to start surfing south towards Cinnabar Island, which you could do in Generation 1 if you wanted to skip the Seafoam Islands dungeon. You're in for a bit of a surprise when you get to Cinnabar Island, however, because as it turns out, Blue is here and he is observing the damage caused by the alleged volcano erupting. I never saw a volcano on Cinnabar Island, but apparently there was one and it has destroyed the entire town, which is actually kind of depressing and... Blue has some very interesting dialogue here. He talks about how natural disasters can take everything away from us while we're busy winning and losing at Pokémon battles, which is very interesting because he reigned as champion for about five minutes before Red showed up. 
That's actually a really interesting character moment. I don't imagine many players were expecting it so early in the Pokemon series. Anyways, after that little chat, Blue teleports to Viridian City, apparently. He just goes off into the sky, just like Lance. They gotta teach me how to do that. You can actually challenge Blue if you want to, but we're gonna head off to the Seafoam Islands because that's where the Cinnabar Gym has relocated to. Well, after I deal with this stupid call... Jeez, I don't know why I have this lady's phone number, I should really just get rid of it. Anyways, the Seafoam Islands are not the sprawling dungeon that they used to be, which is rather unfortunate. I guess the entrance caved in or something. Kind of ironic. The Fire-type gym leader is hiding out in an ice dungeon. Or what's supposed to be an ice dungeon, anyways. That reminds me, actually. The destruction of Cinnabar Island basically means that all of the evidence of Mewtwo's existence is no longer there. It's been completely destroyed. Really interesting. You could almost imagine it's some kind of punishment for Blaine, who was alleged to have been involved in Mewtwo's creation. At least in the game continuity. It varies depending on the continuity, as I have discussed. But since it was a volcano eruption, maybe Blaine had something to do with it. He is an expert on fire-type Pokémon, and if he wanted to, say, destroy all of the evidence of Mewtwo's existence so he could move on with his life... I mean, it is just a theory from me, but it is a very interesting way to think about it, you gotta admit. Oh, I was talking about that so much I missed the beginning of the Blaine battle, I'm sorry. Well, uh, in case you can't figure it out, you surf, you win, the end. He's got three fire types, they're at a decent level for this point in the game, but... You kinda need surf in order to get here in the first place, so you're guaranteed to have a decent water move. I think the only thing that could trip you up is that Magmar. By the way, Blaine finally has Magmar, go figure. Uh, Magmar actually knows Thunder Punch, so if you take Water-type Pokémon into this fight, that could throw you for a loop, but I've got Quagsire, who is Water-Ground-type, so that's no problem here. As you can imagine, Fire is not a good type for a Gym Leader this late in the game, and one of his Pokémon is Magcargo, the evolved form of Slugma. It's Fire Rock, so it's double weak to Water, which is even more embarrassing, somehow. And of course, here's Marowak doing Marowak things as always. So there is something interesting about this gym that's kind of amusing. So, all throughout the Pokémon series, there's a guy in every gym who will give you advice on how to beat the leader. But in this case, he had no idea where to find the gym to begin with, so he only just gets there after you've already beaten the leader. Not that you needed his help, but that kind of implies that it's the same guy in every gym, so he tails you, giving you advice all throughout the region. Wow, okay. It's kind of weird if you think of it that way, but okay. But hey, at the end of the day, that's another badge on our belt, or wherever the badges are kept. I've made this joke already. That means there's only one badge left in the game to get, and then we will have the final dungeon ahead of us. There's one last bit of business, however. I made a brief trip back to Johto, specifically Route 44, to the east of Mahogany Town, because the Super Rod enables us to catch Remoraid. I'm pretty sure you need the Super Rod in order to get this, but... I actually quite like Remoraid's design. It's sort of like a fish-shaped gun, and its evolution is also amusing, which I will get to. I probably could have evolved it straight away, because at level 40 it probably just needs one more level, and then boom, it'll evolve. But I'm saving that for a big evolution montage in the next video. So we'll get to that. In the meantime, I am also going back to the power plant to trade a Dugtrio for a Magneton. This is something you can do only in Crystal version. They added another trade, and Magneton is not that interesting this late in the game, but it is going to be holding a Metal Coat, so if you need another Metal Coat in Crystal version, this is where you can get one. That's kind of nice of them. Wild Magnemite also rarely have Metal Coats as their held items, so that's another place you can get it too. And to close out this video, I return to the Celadon City Pokémon Center where you can find that trainer whose name I can't remember that's obsessed with Suicune. Uh, he shows up here, I think, after you catch the entire Beast Trio. But that's gonna do it for this episode of Pokémon Gold, Silver, and Crystal. Next time, the final gym leader and the finale of the game. See you for that, everybody. It might take two videos, though. Not sure.